Today we're going to talk about how we combine atomic orbitals into molecular orbitals and the terminology that goes with those molecular orbitals like garad and ungarad and what it means to be bound or unbound as an electron in a molecule. So we're going to start by sort of building off of some things we covered in the last lecture, specifically the linear combination of atomic orbitals. You can go back and watch my video on that, but just as a brief refresh here, you can imagine there's this potential, right, for a molecule of, say, hydrogen, and the potential energy looks like not that. The potential energy looks like this. Terribly drawn. Something like this, and there's a bound state all the way across here, right? And we have uh, wave functions that describe an atomic orbital for hydrogen A, and that wave function looks like this because it's a 1s. And the other hydrogen orbital looks like this because it's a 1s. But as you move these two hydrogen atoms, one centered here and one centered here, closer together, you'll start to get an overlap of those wave functions. Right? So you'll start to get an overlap that looks more like The following, and here I'm going to take a little bit more time so it's not quite as messy. And here again, it doesn't go down to zero here because there's now an overlap of these two wave functions, right? So the y-axis here is energy. The x-axis here is the distance between the hydrogen atoms. Again, each of these is its own sort of potential. This is bound, or sorry, this is curved over here. If it was just one atom, right, it would look like this. But it turns over here because there's another atom that its potential on atom A blends into. Okay, so this is sort of the potential energy diagram here. This vertical line is the energy of this electron bound within this potential energy box. And this is what the wave function looks like. But we talked about in last lecture that this is technically the bonding type. And every time we combine atomic orbitals, we do this by combining them in some proportion. So the wave function for the molecular orbital is going to be a combination of the atomic orbital, in this case 1s we're drawing, for hydrogen atom A, and a 1s atomic orbital for hydrogen atom B, and they're weighted by some weighting coefficients. Now, it turns out when I combine these atomic orbitals with these weighting coefficients, all I know about the molecular orbital here is an observable. So all I really know is something about psi squared. And so all we really know here, since the weighting coefficient, if the atom is identical, the weighting coefficient should be equal. But all we can really say is that the square of the weighting coefficient should be equal. The observable for hydrogen atom A should be the same as the observable for hydrogen atom B. So if this is the case because it's the observable, then all I really know for drawing this molecular orbital is that Ca equals plus or minus Cb. And this is only going to be the case for a, a homoatomic like H2, right? Hf would be different. But if they're same atoms here, then the weighting coefficients will be the same, or I should say the squares will be the same. And so the plus here means that the wave function for the molecular orbital is a straight linear combination where the same sign for atomic orbital 1s on hydrogen B is the same sign as the 1s atomic orbital on hydrogen A. Ca equals Cb. That's what's shown here. But you can also have an antibonding case, which I'll draw in red, where Ca is going to equal negative Cb. So we'll still have the same Ca. I'm going to draw it lower, but it should be actually higher in energy, but we'll get to that later. Right? So 
you have the wave function here, you have the wave function down here. Why am I drawing this one upside down? Because it's the negative of what CA is. So here we're going to draw CA is the minus of CB. And what I'm drawing here is the molecular orbital, right? Where the molecular orbital is a combination of these two things. So what I'm drawing here is the molecular orbital CA atomic orbital A minus CB atomic orbital of hydrogen B. Okay, so this minus signs means I basically flip the amplitude relative to this energy line here. And so now, this is the shape that happens. Here I've got constructive interference, but for the antibonding, I get destructive interference and I get a node. Again, this should be translated up some to be basically on top of this for visualization purposes. I've moved it down. And so where this goes through zero, if the energy axis here is zero, that's a node. Okay, so this is bonding versus antibonding molecular orbitals being built out of atomic orbitals. Now, we're going to expand this today and talk about how we have terminology for these molecular orbitals. Both molecular orbitals are possible, and we differentiate them. We can draw them, that's true, but if we wanted to refer to them, we need some way to refer to these with some terminology, and the terminology we use is the following. We'll start with the bonding molecular orbital here. Okay, we call this bonding molecular orbital a having even symmetry. So we're going to make the terminology reflective of the symmetry of these molecular orbitals. Even symmetry means this. And the bonding molecular orbitals won't always be even symmetry. It just is in this case, hydrogen's bonding molecular orbital here that I've drawn has even symmetry. And even symmetry means the following. The wave function of this molecular orbital for coordinates x, y, z has the same amplitude, it's the same amount, same magnitude, as if I look at negative x, negative y, negative z. So an even function like we typically think about it in math would be something like x squared, x to the power n. If n is even, it's an even function. If n is odd, it's an odd function. So x squared here is an even function. Why? Because if I go out in the x-axis, the sine of this is the same as if I go negative x. It's the same sign, right? Where x cubed In the x direction, it's positive y. In the negative x direction, it's negative y. So that would be odd symmetry. Where the wave function x, y, z is negative. The wave function at negative x, negative y, negative z. Okay, so here, this bonding molecular orbital, we're going to take sort of this, this center line here as, say, x equals 0. And so if I look to the right, this peak in positive x is the same sign as this peak negative x. Okay, so this bonding molecular orbital has even symmetry. And we call this garad. Garad in English, but it comes from the German gerat. So you want to have that harsh ending to the word to give you that German accent, gerat, which is German for even. Okay, so we say this is gerat. And you'll see it listed by G symmetry. This odd symmetry, this is the antibonding case here for hydrogen. And this we call uneven or ungurat. Or 
or U symmetry. And again, this is the red curve here. I guess this node should probably be drawn as passing through right here. But the same point can be made, no matter how poorly you draw the line, that this point here in the positive x has the opposite sign of the point in the negative x. Okay, so this is clearly odd symmetry, kind of like a graph of x cubed. And so this is ungarat. Now, usually we write then the total molecular orbital. If we just want to talk about what are the possibilities here, the possibilities of the molecular orbital I'm building, right, for H2, and specifically what we're looking for here in the context of the previous lectures is H2 plus just a single electron in this molecule. And the molecular orbital I find here for hydrogen, molecular hydrogen, right, is some weighted contribution of the atomic orbital for hydrogen A, plus or minus the weighted contribution from hydrogen B. And you can factor out the C here, actually, because CA is the same magnitude as CB. So sometimes you'll just see this as C, HA plus or minus the atomic orbital for HB. And so this is what we're going to show on a molecular orbital diagram, these two possibilities. So here we'll draw then our first MO diagram, although you've seen these in general chemistry and perhaps inorganic chemistry. This is the first one we've drawn at least in this class in physical chemistry. So here's a molecular orbital diagram. This is my energy axis here. And here is the energy perhaps of the 1s orbital for hydrogen A. All right, so over here I have hydrogen A, over here I have hydrogen B. Before we were drawing the actual shape of the wave function, now we're just describing the energies of the wave functions that I form. And so this is an atomic orbital, this is an atomic orbital and its energy. The molecular orbital that forms, I'm drawing here in the middle. And what happens here is when I combine these two atomic orbitals, I get a benefit. And we talked about this in the previous video, we'll talk about it more today. But this benefit is exactly because we have some extra electron density now here between the two atoms. So in my bonding case, right, I actually get an enhancement of the electron density in here between the two nuclei. And so now the electron between two protons sees both of those positive charges and is attracted to both. So more beneficial attraction, there's a stability there. Okay, It's also freely delocalized across the whole two-atom system. And that's essentially like a longer box for our particle in a box problem. And the longer the box, the energy was proportional to 1 over A, where A was the box length. So the longer the box, the lower the energy. Okay, So that's the benefit here of that bonding case. So the molecular orbital, shown here in the middle versus these atomic orbitals is actually lower, but only for the bonding case, right? Only for this, what we'll call grad molecular orbital, that kind of looked like Batman's mask, right? So this is the beneficial bonding molecular orbital. Now, turns out, right, we always have two cases here, bonding and antibonding. This is the Ungarad from our previous. This is the one that, maybe I'll draw it out here to the side because I'm going to need to draw that spot. This is the Ungarad or antibonding molecular orbital. Now again, don't get confused because not necessarily every bonding orbital is Garad and every antibonding orbital is Ungarad. Only assign Ungarad and Garad based on this even or uneven function, right? Garat for even, Ungarat for uneven. 
Okay, so some of the conclusions of what we've drawn here is that these two localized atomic orbitals, right? These electrons, these 1s electrons that are in these spherical clouds of negative charge around the hydrogen atomic nuclei, they're localized. They combine to form two delocalized molecular orbitals. So when you combine two atomic orbitals, you get two molecular orbitals. One lower in energy, one higher in energy than the atomic orbital energy. So this right here was the atomic orbital energy. There's an enhancement, beneficial energy reduction for bonding, and a cost associated with this antibonding case because of this node. Okay, molecular orbitals are always going to have this designation of grat or ungrat. It's how we refer to them. And we'll see as we draw these molecular diagrams, much like we had electron configurations for atoms, 1s, 2s, etc., we're going to replace that now with things like 1 sigma grad, 1 sigma ungrad, etc. So it's just how we refer to these, much like we refer to atomic orbitals as 1s or 2p. Okay, some other things here is that the atomic orbital coefficients, these weighting coefficients, have the same sign in this lower molecular orbital and opposite signs in this higher molecular orbital. One really important thing I haven't said yet is this molecular orbital diagram is only true for certain, or I guess for a single value of R. Right, where R is our distance between the nuclei. Right, so back here, this internuclear distance, that is our R, our radius between them. Okay, so assuming a certain distance between the two atomic nuclei, this is the energetic benefit. Why? Because the amount those electrons overlap or don't overlap depends on the distance between the atoms. So molecular orbital diagrams often we look to for you know, understanding of stability, but it's sort of a limited concept because it's only drawn for a certain atomic internuclear distance. Now, what you want to do is take this diagram and calculate it at a bunch of different values of R, okay? And catalog what is happening to this bonding molecular orbital and what is happening to this antibonding molecular orbital. And so that's what we'll show here. We'll make another diagram here. Again, as seems like is always the case here, energy on our y-axis. X-axis is the internuclear separation. And perhaps on that previous ga uh, graph, we were here and here. Okay, maybe this was my energy of my Garad molecular orbital, and this is my energy of my Ungarad molecular orbital. All right, the Ungarad was higher, here's the Garad. The zero here is going to be sort of infinite separation between the two nuclei, what is that energy? Okay, so we'll call this zero energy of this axis where it intersects the y-axis here. This zero on the y-axis of energy an energy of zero is when the two atoms are infinitely separated. Now, what you want to do is go back and solve the wave function for different values of R, find out what these energies are for these molecular orbitals, and plot them on a graph. Okay, and when you do that for H2, right, you get the following shape. This should probably asymptote, I guess, to zero. Okay, so now I'm drawing curves based on the energies of these orbitals at a bunch of different values of R. Okay, so let's look at, at very close values of R. The atoms are basically on top of each other, right? 
the energy of the electrons doesn't matter if it's bonding or antibonding. The energies are going to be really, really high. The molecule is not going to be stable. The electrons aren't going to be want to want to be associated with two protons from separate atoms on top of each other. Okay, the antibonding is also escalating. But as I bring these two atoms further and further apart, so as I walk to the right on this diagram, what happens? Well, now I get to some internuclear separation where the electron distribution in this molecular orbital that is garage, that is shaped like this, becomes beneficial, right? And there's a magical distance, we'll call it right here, the minimum, right? This equilibrium bond length we'll call RE. That is the most stable situation for the bonding molecular orbital based on the distance between these two atoms. And it turns out that the energy here between this zero and this bottom here, we call that the bond energy. Which is the energy of the molecule at this, separate, uh, as, at this certain equilibrium bond length minus the energy when R is at infinity. Right, so that's the bond energy here. How much energy it takes to escape this well, right? This electron that is, you know, has this energy for this internuclear separation. Well, if I shine a photon of light that exceeds this amount, it can leave, right? Just like my particle in a box, if I give the electron enough energy, it can escape that well or that box. The same is going to be the case here. If I give this electron down here enough energy, it can escape the molecule in this case, right? So uh, this is the Garat energy. This is the Ungarat energy. And I should say these labels U and G really only apply for homonuclear diatomics, right? Where both of these atoms are the same. In the case that you have hydrogen and say fluorine, we don't tend to use Garat and Ungarat because it messes up the symmetry. So we really only use these four homonuclear diatomics like H2 or N2, etc. Okay, and again, Garad is not necessarily always bonding. Ungarad is not necessarily always antibonding. We'll get into that later in the lecture. Okay, so here, the wave function, Garat, that is to say this molecular orbital, Garat, describes the stable existence of H2+. Since it has a minimum. We call this then a bound state. Right, where this electron is bound to these nuclei confined in this well. You can get it out of the well, again, by giving it a photon energy sufficient to escape from the well, right? But we call this a bound state. Again, it's not necessarily that Garad is always going to be bonding or is always going to be a bound state in the same way that Ungarad does not necessarily mean it's anti-bonding, does not necessarily mean it's unbound. But in this case, our wave function for Ungarad is an unbound state. Why? It's an unbound state because no matter where I am, the energy is going to be lower if I go to very large R's, which is to say if the two atoms move apart from one another. Okay, so you can just imagine this very classically like having a marble and placing a marble right here. Well, the atoms will move together, the marble rolls down the hill, it settles here. This is the equilibrium bond length. But if I put a marble here, what happens? The marble rolls down the hill, the atoms move apart. It's unbound. The atoms will fall apart. There won't be a chemical bond formed. And so H2 plus won't exist if I excite this electron to the unbound state. It'll fall apart. Okay, so the Wave function Ungarad here in this example is the unbound state. If it's in this state, the molecule will then dissociate.
Okay, so we have Ungarad versus Grad. We have bonding versus anti-bonding. The bonding over here has no nodes. The anti-bonding has a node between the nuclei. We know that these are formed based on these weighting coefficients having the same or opposite signs. And we could talk a little bit more about that too, because we know we're most concerned with wave function squared. So the bonding molecular orbital here, which looked like Batman, becomes a more exaggerated Batman. And the antibonding here If you square that, you get something like this, right? Because again, this is psi squared. We're taking this and squaring it. So this negative sign turns to a positive. That's how we have this shape, okay? But here notice that between the two nuclei, so if there's a hydrogen here and here, this does not reach zero, it's not a node, but here, the molecular orbital squared, this is a node. Okay, so these are the molecular orbitals once we've squared them, this is what they would look like. And this is what we're mostly concerned about in quantum mechanics, because this tells us, you know, the probability of finding the electron. The probability of finding the electron between the nuclei is large over here, right? If this is my first nucleus, this is my sep second. Well, here's the probability I find the electron between the two nuclei. Whereas here to here, this is going to be less area than up here, right? And it might not look like it, but rest assured, if you had somebody draw it correctly, Antibonding would have less area here shaded than bonding, right? Because of this node. This does not reach all the way to zero. It's bonding. This does. There's a node. It's antibonding. Now, we can show this, I guess, more algebraically. My garage state here that I'm squaring, which came from, right? Garage came from. the case where the atomic orbital for A was added, not subtracted, right? It's about the sign of C that we've now factored out. There's my garad. Here's my ungarad. It is when there is a subtraction between these two. Right, again, we've just factored out C here. That's what we were talking about down here. There is no real CA and CB. If it's a homonuclear diatomic, they're both hydrogens. The Cs are the same. It just matters what is the sign plus or minus. For Garad, it's plus. For Ungarad, it's minus. Now, we want psi squared, so let's square both of these things. And let's factor them out. Okay, let's first look at Garad squared. And we get C squared. Atomic orbital A squared, atomic orbital B squared, and then please don't close the parentheses there, right? A plus B squared. I know you really want this to be true, but it's not, okay? The number of points students lose from that mistake right there is super frustrating. Don't be that student. A plus B squared is not A squared plus B squared. You FOIL. And what you end up with is this third term. Like this. Ungarad you can look at as well. Same story here. You get a C squared. You get H A squared plus H B squared that is the atomic orbital, hb, 
Only now we have minus 2 HA HB. Now, I want to point out this right here, and the sign is positive. When I square the molecular orbital, this is extra goodness. This right here is the benefit. This is extra density in my molecular orbital. Constructive interference. That's great. This right here, it's got a minus sign. This is the result of the destructive interference. This is missing electron density. That's not great. And so this is an overall, should be Ungarad here. This is an overall destabilization here because of this missing density, because of this destructive interference, because CA is minus CB. Okay, so this extra density here, again, that we're gaining right in this area, okay, is akin to saying the box length grows, and since energy is proportional to one over the box length in our particle in a box analog, the molecule's energy is lowered overall. The electron feels both nuclei, the potential of both protons, pulling it, but it's in the track right it's a coulomb attraction and so these together really explain chemical bond formation the electron is delocalized across both nuclei but it gets to see both nuclei as well okay the last thing we're going to talk about in this lecture is molecular orbitals for other atomic orbitals okay so far we've been talking about just the 1s electron and we have these radiographs in previous lectures Right, where we draw the 1s electron, it looks like this. The 2s electron looks like this. The 2p electron looks like this. Right, and this is the function that describes distance from the nucleus, little r what is the amplitude of the wave function, and you square it to figure out the probability, along with the angular terms, of finding the electron at the certain distance from the nucleus. Okay, so this is 1s, 2s, 2p. We've so far been building things off of this, and so this is from 0 to r in a radial dimension. Of course, all of our plots, we've been drawing this sort of, sort of spun around this y-axis here, right? So this 1s became this in our drawings. Right, And we combine two 1s electrons to get that Batman shape for the molecular orbital that is bonding. We can do the same sort of thing for 2s. Okay, If you imagine spinning this graph around, you get an atomic orbital shape before we build the molecular orbital shape that looks like this. And then spinning it around, it looks like this on the other side. And so now if I'm trying to combine this, and two of them, right, what might I get? Okay, so if this is my 2s atomic orbital, just like I had this as my 1s atomic orbital, you should be able to draw molecular orbitals bonding and antibonding built from all of these. We did it here before. We have an antibonding that looks like this. We have a bonding that looks like Batman. Here we're going to get to and sometimes it's shown by flipping the sign. You'll, you'll see this in a second. The garage here would look like this. Maybe I'll draw it out and actually label the hydrogens to make it a little easier. Here's a hydrogen. Here's a hydrogen. I'll get a shape that looks like the following. Okay, so this is this on two different atoms. And then there will be an overlap 
giving all this extra electro density, electron density in the middle. Right? And so this, this most intense part for 1s, right, is centered exactly on each nuclei because that is my zero here on this diagram of big R of the wave function, the radial part of the atomic orbital, right? So these are atomic orbitals. I'm combining them to make molecular orbitals, right? So these are molecular orbitals. This is a molecular orbital. This is uh, actually bonding here. So this should actually be down here. On a molecular orbital diagram, right, this bonding one would be below this antibonding one I'm about to draw. Down here, when we get to 2p, we'll see it looks a little different in terms of whether it looks centered on each nucleus or not. But the Ungarad molecular orbital, which is also antibonding here, this is Garad, why it is an even shaped function. Okay, down here, what does the Ungarad look like? Well, I have to flip the sign of one of these. Okay, and so when I do that, I might still have the right side looking the same here. Okay, but this side I flipped, and so will look like this. And then there's a node between them. Okay, so now this is my 2s antibonding molecular orbital. This is Ungarad because it's odd shaped. This is Garat because it's even shaped. Okay, you can do the same thing with 2p, making a bonding molecular orbital and an antibonding molecular orbital. And I would encourage you to try to draw this, which I'll show you in a second, as well as higher ones, maybe for 3s or 3p based on those wave functions. Okay. Again, you have to spin this around the axis to get a shape that would look like this. Okay, it's not quite the same here. You actually have an opposite sign here when you spin this around based on the nature of the angular momentum state. And so now combining this 2p orbital, you get two different types, a bonding which will look like this actually. where centered on the hydrogen is right here and right here. There's still going to be extra density right here between the two. So that's my bonding case for 2p, my anti-bonding for 2p should have a node between them. And indeed it does. The right side of the graph is going to look somewhat similar. It's going to peak here and come back down. This is going to peak here and come back down. And then there's going to be a node between them. Okay, so this is my antibonding, which happens to be Ungarad. This is my bonding, which happens to be Garad, based on my 2p atomic orbitals that I'm combining. And these are the excited states of H2+. So before we were just drawing the Garad and Ungarad molecular orbitals, the bonding and antibonding molecular orbitals based on the 1s electrons, because those are the lowest. Those are going to be the ground state molecular orbitals. But I can make excited state molecular orbitals. And so I can have a molecular orbital diagram for hydrogen that includes these different excited states. Usually the electrons are going to reside in what? The bonding 1s molecular orbital. But you can promote these electrons, or the single electron here in H2+, to these different excited molecular orbitals. Okay, so that'll do it for today's lecture. Next lecture, we'll talk about pi and sigma molecular orbitals and how to build more complex molecular orbital diagrams, SP mixing, what the molecular orbital diagram looks like for fluorine versus nitrogen, and how that explains stability of various molecules. So, that'll do it for today. See you next time.